Today I want to talk about a subject that everyone talks about it outside of church, and it's okay. But when the pastor dares to speak on this subject, folks get nervous and think it should be left alone. What subject do you reckon I'm going to talk about? Money. That's right. Money. A lot of people say, just leave it alone, uh, everything will be fine. You see, I I've got incredibly good news on how to get squared away financially, those of you that are mired in debt. And I want to add to that a tremendous challenge at the end of this sermon where you'll have a wonderful opportunity to begin a new kind of walk with God. I you see, when you go to the book of Proverbs, very interesting book to read, but it doesn't read like the book of Acts or like the book of Philippians, or like the book of Romans. It just kind of scattered thoughts thrown in there. Like somebody wrote them all out, cut them up, put them in a hat, and then pulled them out. And so if you want to study something in Proverbs, you get a concordance. You look up the word, like you're going to study money. You look up every place that says something about money, and you tie all that information together. And I haven't got it all tied together this morning, but I've got one tied together that I think is uh, kind of good for us because it's a common struggle that people have in the proper use of money. We, we've got three problems that face all of us. One is that it's not the amount of money that we have, but the proper use of the money we do have. I, a number of times I've had people say to me, I'm going to tell you something, Buf. If I ever hit the lottery, this church will never have another need. Do you know what I do? When I get back to the office, I go in and check on their giving record, and I know they've just told me a lie. Because they do not give out of what they now have. They will not give out of some load that might be dropped on them. It absolutely is a cop-out. If you're not handling the amount you have properly, getting a bundle more will not change your action. Secondly... Discipline. The strong tendency is to charge now, pay later. And we're stacked so high with later that we don't have anything for God in the now. Thirdly, the problem of balancing wants and needs. I need that. You don't need it at all. You want that. If you have the courage to talk, I want that so badly that I'll sacrifice something else for it. And usually the sacrifice comes at the expense of being obedient to God. And I want to talk with us about that out of the book of Proverbs, the five principles of money management, God's way that he lays out really clearly. We start by just listening to what is said about the book of Proverbs. The purpose of these Proverbs is to teach people wisdom and discipline and to help them understand wise sayings. Through these Proverbs, people will receive instruction in discipline, good conduct, and doing what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will make the simple-minded clever. Oh, I love that, don't you? Some of us are very simple-minded. And God says, if you'll use these properly, you as a simple minded, not stupid, just simple minded. You're not Einstein. Have you figured that out yet? Simple, you can become clever. I like that. Man, that's good. They will give knowledge and purpose to young people. Got that straight, kids? Proverbs give you knowledge and give you lots of wisdom. Let those who are wise. Listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser, and let those who understand receive guidance by exploring the depth of meaning in these Proverbs, parables, wise sayings, and riddles. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Only fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now, understanding that, you understand you have to hop around through Proverbs to find what you want on any given subject. And this morning, we're talking about God's principles of money management. Number one. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, read like this. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything your land produces. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats with overflow with fine wine. Now, you don't have barns and vats. I know that. 
He was talking to the crowd in that day, saying, here's the best deal you can get. Your barn full of grain, your vats overflowing with good wine, the best possible. That's what I'll do. And this is a command. You see what it says? Honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part, the first part of everything. A straight command, not a suggestion, not an encouragement, but a straight command. Over in the 10th chapter, the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich and he adds no sorrow with it. God says, honor me according to all instruction I've given to you, my people, to give me 10%, it is mine, right off the top, the first thing out of the chute. Now let me tell you why I'm so fully persuaded this stuff works. When I was a kid, my dad worked at the same company for 44 years. He never missed a day of work during the Depression. He never made a lot of money. But we lived in a company house, and that money was steady. And my dad was a tither. Absolutely, no matter how much money my mother spent, and she knew how to spend it, my dad was a tither. And we came to a point in our home where dad sat us down and he said, folks, we've got uh, a decision to make. We either pay the tithe and let the car go back to the finance company or pay the car and forget about God. And he said, I've made the decision. He didn't hang around waiting for a vote. <laughs> he voted to let the car go back to the finance company and that was a killer. I hated it. When we went to church, Somebody had to come and pick us up. Oh, gosh, I would get in the back seat of that car with my head down. I was embarrassed. We didn't have a car. We had to walk to that store that was down Cherry Avenue, the foot of Cherry Avenue, and walk back up carrying those groceries. But the worst part was the embarrassment of not having a car to go to church in. I'll tell you something. My dad taught me a lesson that I never forgot and that I've practiced all my life. Give God what belongs to him, and then every, every once in a while, give him a little more just for fun. Great lesson. Never forgot it. And a part of the blessing of God on us in our family and in our home is that we have been faithful to give God regularly, consistently. First check that is written out of every paycheck is the check to this church for a whole lot more than 10%, simply because I believe that as we, well, I'll tell you later about how that works. He says, it's a command, honor me with the first fruit of that which you earn. And I ask you the question, are you doing it? Secondly, those who make the gathering of wealth their main passion often pay a heavy price. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Don't worry yourself trying to get rich. Why waste your time? For riches can disappear as though they had the wings of a bird. Somebody said, money talks. It says, bye-bye. <laughs> it has the wings of a bird, man. It leaves in a hurry. Also says, if you can't pay it, even your bed. Oh, do not co-sign. Here's the other one. Do not co-sign another person's note or put up a guarantee for someone else's loan. If you can't pay it, even your bed will be snatched from under you. Huh? You like that? Boy, that's right on the money, isn't it? In, in uh, Proverbs chapter 28, listen to this one. 28, honest workers have plenty of food. Playing around brings poverty. The trustworthy will get a rich reward. The greedy person tries to get rich quick, but it only leads to poverty. Everybody trying to get rich quick. And not honoring God. See, you get on the foundation. Take the first step. Honor God with the first fruit. And if you make the gathering of wealth your primary goal, believe me, you're going to suffer and you're going to struggle and you're going to scramble because you're trying to get rich. Thirdly, increased wealth brings increased complications in your life. Two things that show up. False security. Oh, I tell you, it's interesting to watch false security jump on uh, Proverbs 18, chapter 11. Eight, uh, chapter 18, number 11. The rich think of their wealth as a, an impregnable defense. They imagine it is a high wall of safety. 
Watch a rich guy and watch how he acts. He can buy anything he wants. He can go anywhere he wants. He can do anything he wants. And he thinks this thing is going to keep him from any problem. It is a false sense of security. Secondly, wealth brings phony friends. In chapter 19 and verse 4, wealth makes many friends, it says. Got those little goodies around there, huh? Wealth makes many friends. Poverty drives them away. You ever watch a, you know, when you're just clicking by a major league boxing match? Hey, when the champion comes in, what's he got with him? Man, he's got an entourage with him coming right behind him. The little fighter that was in two fights before that, you know, the kind of the early card, he comes in, only his mama comes with him, and she doesn't want to be there, you know, because she doesn't want to see her kid beat up, but he's got no money yet. He's not in the money. He's not in chips. Those friends gather around those big-time sports stars, and they can't get enough of leeching off of them. But when the guy goes down the drain, those friends just fade away, and it'll happen to you too. Number four, money cannot buy life's most valuable possessions. Look in 15, verse 16 and 17. It's better to have little with fear for the Lord than to have great treasure with turmoil. A bowl of soup with someone you love is better than steak with someone you hate. Interesting. Several people have made lists of what money can buy and what it can't buy. Money can buy a house, but not a home. You see, the reason the real estate guy says he wants to sell you a home, which he can't do, is because it sounds warmer, because it is warmer. He can sell you a house. You make it a home. Money can buy influence, but not integrity. And if you need a primary example of that, just take a look at our city and the mess it's in. Number three, you can buy books, but not brains. Boy, that's a bummer, isn't it? Huh? A lot of us bought a lot of books going to school. Help us, Lord. <laughs> you can buy a bed, but not sleep. A lot of rich guys tumbling and tossing and rolling around and trying to figure out how they can keep all they've got because everybody's trying to get it from them. Whole family's waiting for them to die. You can buy a bed, but not sleep. You can buy medicine, but not health. Howard Hughes, one of the weirdest guys that ever lived. He had more money. He could sink a battleship with the money he had. But he was so worried about what all was going to happen to him that his health was shot, and he became this weird recluse with all of this money and all of these people waiting on him while his hair grew long and his fingernails grew long because he's afraid somebody's gonna gonna try to poison him or something. He had people taste his food. He did all kinds of weird things. Buy medicine, but not health. You can buy sex, but not love. Just think about all the people that are caught in the trap of trying to buy sex for some kind of satisfaction but there's no love involved at all. You can buy food, but not an appetite. You sit with someone who's very sick, very ill, they've lost their sense of taste, and put their most gorgeous, fabulous, wonderful, favorite meal in front of them. There's no appetite. No appetite. You can buy pleasure, but not peace. If you happen to be watching CNN last night, you saw a marvelous interview with one of the most bodacious athletes on the scene. Deion Sanders. Some of you ladies may not know who he is. He plays baseball and football. He is incredibly talented, but he is absolutely one of the most nauseating guys to watch because of his behavior. He said on CNN last night in an interview, I've had it all. I've got millions of dollars. I've owned every kind of car that could bring a man to light. I've got more jewelry than I can shake a stick at. You wonder how he walks. and got all that gold hanging around his neck. But he said, I've not got any peace in my life until I've given my heart to Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, he wasn't on Uncle Ezra's little five water down here in Springville. He was on CNN across this country making that statement. And I'll tell you what else he said. You talk about guts. He said, I have been a fornicator, 
against my wife. I have absolutely run with women everywhere. And I've come to the place of asking God to forgive me and make me holy in his sight through Jesus Christ. That's powerhouse. He learned pleasure, but not peace. You can buy a crucifix, but not a savior. You can buy companionship, but not friendship. You can buy a church building, but not heaven. I've taken a lot of money over the years from non-Christian people, but I always tell them one thing. This doesn't buy you one square inch of real estate in heaven. Can't buy your way in. I'll take your money, but it can't buy your way in. <laughs> Just understand that, okay? I have no problem doing that. See, if I give them any kind of false hope that this puts them on the right road, I'm in deep trouble. Five, the careless use of credit brings stress and slavery to your life. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. So clear. Goes on to say this, do not co-sign another person's note or put up a guarantee for someone else's loan. If you can't pay it, even your bed will be snatched from under you. Well, that's great advice. A lot of us have, have disregarded that. We've loaned money to a lot of people. And that's the last you see them. They're down the road and they're telling you, yeah, I'm going to pay you. Pre I mean, my money. Not I don't loan the church's money. And I'm about the place where I'm never going to loan my own again. Because of this very thing. See, people get under the load because of the careless use of credit and the stress that comes. One of the reasons I'm doing this message, listen, people. I'm weary of the divorce rate in the church being as high as it is outside the church. And one of the key reasons for divorce, any marriage counseling book you read will tell you that 50 to 60% of the problems inside a marriage revolve around money. And the stress that comes in the marriage because of the money problems causes people to fight over everything and ultimately divorce because they cannot reconcile things in the arena of money. Now, our money involves earning and spending and giving and saving and investing and lending and borrowing and planning for the future. My question is this, is God honored with each of these activities in your life in relation to the money he's entrusted to you? Now, here's the clincher. This is the part I want to really lay on you. Listen carefully. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 reads this way. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. That's us. Individual believers make up the body of Christ. He's the head of the church. He is the first of all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, and he is to be first in everything in our lives. Question. Is he first in the money department in your life? Secondly, Luke 6, 38, Jesus is talking. And Jesus says, if you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more and running over. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it'll be used to measure what it's giving back to you. That's a law of this world. The giving and receiving law, and it's not for believers, it's for everybody. It's like the law of gravity. Take Billy Graham and Adolf Hitler to the top of a 40-story building and tell them both to jump. You know what you got? You got two dead birds laying on the ground when it's over. The law of gravity operates with both Hitler and Graham. The law of return operates for anybody who will buy into the notion and understand 10% of what I have regularly belongs to God. And if I'm not doing that, if I'm not taking care of that, whatever measure I give, that's the way it's going to come back to me. Finally, Malachi chapter 3. God says to his people, should people cheat God? But you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. 
You're under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord Almighty, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room to take it in. Try it. Let me prove it to you. God says, make a deal. Do things my way and see how you are. See how it goes. See, my concern is this. I look ahead to the years ahead of this church. And when some of us have passed from the scene, because most of the money comes from the 50 and up crowd, 20% of the people in this church give 80% of the money. We have scores of people that freeload here constantly, believers that say they believe the word in regard to the salvation of their soul, but do nothing about honoring God with their money. Refuse to obey, refuse to do a thing that causes havoc in their lives. And my urgency says, get you on the right page with your money, and a lot of stuff is going to fall together for you. Fall into place. And you're going to find a whole new delight. Let me tell you what I'm praying for and what I'm asking you to be a part of. I'm asking God for a hundred families who will make a written declaration that they are not now tithing, they're not giving 10% of what they bring home to God, that they'll start in September of 1997 on a 12-month Prove it to me, God, that you'll really take care of me like you say you will. I want you to use a card. I want to know who you are. That you will take this step of faith and say, I will begin to obey God. I've wrestled and kicked this around, but I've never gotten down to business on it. My finances are a mess. Our home is in struggle. We have never believed God would do it. We've always said, yes, he will do it, but we've never taken advantage of the opportunity to give regularly, like it says in Corinthians, the first day a week. When you get your check, write the check to the church. And write the 10% check to the church, because that's how God says it ought to happen. And watch what I'll do for you if you will obey me and get out of that disobedient group that refuses to comply with my orders. Now, that's the crowd I'm looking for. And I want you to, to go home. I want you to talk about it. I want you to make a commitment. And I want written confirmation from you this week that starting September 1st, you're going to start a 12-month period of giving God what belongs to him. Now, here's my part of it. If at the end of 12 months, August 31st, 1998, God has not proved himself to be true, I want you to come to me with your records showing you've done your part, your income, your expenses, and your giving, and how you're in deep trouble. You've paid attention to the five principles of money management, and God has not proven himself. And I'm going to tell you what I'll do. I personally, not the church, I personally will reimburse you every dollar you've given to the church in that 12-month period. I told a guy in Turlock, preacher in Turlock yesterday, I was going to do this today. He said, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm not. I believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. Consequently, giving on that scale and more has been a principle of my life. And God has demonstrated his blessing, not just in monetary things, but in so many things that I am rich in in friends and in converts and in family that God wants to enrich our lives if we'll simply let him. And I know this, if I'm not willing to put my neck out there to say, I will repay you every dollar you gave if God isn't faithful to you when you do things his way, I am not afraid to do that. I'm not showboating. I'm not bragging. I'm not doing something just to be wild and crazy. I am trying to get you to face into the fact that until you get your finances straight with God, you'll never get them straight and you'll never know the joy you ought to know. I am weary of people who assume places of leadership in this church who do not give. 
It ought not to be. And believe me, it's not going to be. That's not a threat, folks. That's a promise. I am a fool to take somebody that I know is willfully and consistently disobedient to God every knock and payday. They just tell God to kiss off. I'll catch you later, Lord. I got something over here I want. It's not something I need. It's something I want. And I'm going to satisfy my wants and we'll worry about heaven later. I'm not angry. But I can't believe that a bunch of folks that subscribe to the Bible will treat God like he's a fool. You'll go to dinner, you'll tip 10, 15, 20%. There are many people in this church that have given more tip in one dinner somewhere along the way this year than they've ever given from January till today in the ministry of this church. I don't know how the Sam Hill people think we could keep going. We couldn't stay open 30 minutes because the lights wouldn't be on if it were not for people who give way beyond what God has called them to give. I want you to know the best blessing God has for you. I want you to know experiencing God starts right here. This is bottom line stuff. And I'm praying that God will give me 100 people this week that will sign up. I'm not a tither. But starting September 1, we're in the wagon. Think about that. Pray about it. Read Colossians 1 this week. See what God says about Jesus being the head in everything. Stand with me and let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you this morning for the wonderful privilege to be yours. To be covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and to recognize the fact we can never repay what's been done for us. God, how I pray that the strong conviction of the Spirit of God would be allowed to overwhelm people as they consider this message, your word, and their disobedience. Bring them to the altar. Bring them to that place of saying, I will write it down and give it to Buf. Help them to understand what I'm doing. And it's for the strong benefit of them and their families, as well as the ongoing ministry of this church, to reach a world that needs Jesus Christ. So bless us. Dismiss us with your blessing. We look forward to tonight with a great time. And we thank you again. You are so awesome. In Jesus' name, amen.